you know how to do it. I mean, you know, because you have the data to do it. What if it goes into your like data now? Yeah, because you know, this year I never realized that's how it actually works. My money just coming back in times. Yeah, I need better things. I'm sorry, you were on on my list for another reason. Yeah, I mean, um, some complicated things. So, but you have added things for me, so you can say that's what I'm doing now. What are you doing now? Yeah, I'm getting here. Hello. Yes. All right. Video. I don't. I don't see it. Yeah. Okay. I think there's the camera there. Well, hello. Now it's official. Welcome to the Food and Agriculture Pavilion. And thank you so much to those of you in this room at an evening hour and to many, many of you from around the world joining us on Zoom and hopefully enjoying this recording for a long time to come after tonight. My name is Sarah Farley. I'm Vice President at the Rockefeller Foundation. I lead our global work on food, regenerative, agroecological production. Welcome. And uh, thank you so much for coming here at the Top Chaos. No one is ever late to events. I think it's just you arrive when you're meant to be there. Um, the theme this year of this pavilion is tackling the food and climate crises together. And I think everyone joining this conversation is enthusiastic about the idea of tools, alliances, partnerships, and methods that let us get out of our box, get out of our silo and see the multiple dimensions, multiple costs of food systems transformation in a more integrated and aligned way. I'll say for my own institution, the Rockefeller Foundation, we've been really leaning into this tool and this approach that we'll be talking about for the next hour through cost accounting or true value accounting for a number of years now, because we think it's tremendous, if not irreplaceable in its way to elucidate the full rainbow of externalities that we need to be contending with when we confront food. Um, we are joined by a very large scary number that is on the screen behind us. And I wanna open with us all looking at this number, $42 trillion and change. You'll see it's a thicker, it's growing as I talk. And as we sit here, it's actually growing $50 million USD every five minutes. So this is an estimate. Oh, it just went away. This is an estimate of the accumulated total cost of our food systems since the signing of the Paris Agreement. So this puts it all into perspective. We talk about the annualized external costs. We're so excited to get into that with David and the other speakers here today, given our SOFA report of this year. But when you really look at the cumulative number, we have to get incredibly serious about action to understand this number and do something about it. And so um, let's dive right in with these extraordinary speakers who are on stage to help us understand the power of true cost accounting as a method to help us examine the environmental, the social, the economic, the health, the equity costs of our food system and tell us firsthand what it what it helps us do when we use a tool like true cost accounting. And so um, we will start hearing directly from one of the co-chairs of the Food Systems Economics Commission, an incredible effort uh, designed to take us very deeply into this approach and understand the true cost in specific contexts and under specific scenarios. We'll go to uh, FAO and the recently released State of Food and Agriculture Report, which has elevated TCA on the global stage in a way we could have only dreamed of. And we'll go to a funder who's really been quite progressive in elucidating this and other approaches to examine the total cost of food, which is IKEA. All right. So to begin, we're going to go to Otmar. Otmar Edenhoff. He's one of three. Food Systems Economics Commission's co-chair. 
He's director and chief economist of the Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research, as well as the director of the Mercator, a research institute on global commons and climate change, and professor for climate economics and public policy at the Technische Universität Berlin. So, Otmar, thank you so much for giving us time on this important conversation. Both the forthcoming Food Systems Economics Commission work, which we'll get our hands on in January, I'm so excited, and the FAO report reveal that our food systems externalities vastly outweigh the costs that we're paying for these systems. Why, given that we already had a sense of this, why was the Food Systems Economics Commission work needed? Why was it commissioned first? And then looking at that giant number on the screen that we are sitting under, you know, what is the significance of the analysis that you're about to put forward in the world? Yeah, thanks a lot uh, for explaining this. And I would like to, to start, so to say, uh, when I report about the food uh, economics, uh, the Food System Economics Commission, it's basically like a, a stern report evaluating the costs of action and non-action. But before I do this, I would like to remind us what's economics all about. And economics is not about dollars. It's not about euros. It's not about money. My, my, most people might be surprised, but this is not about economics. So economics is fundamentally about scarcity. So what is scarce in a society? And there is always a scarcity. And if you have, if you're operating in a in a in a situation of scarcity, and you have to make decisions, so you have obviously trade-off. So we economists believe that living without trade-offs is something for heaven, but not for earth. So it's about scarcity. And the question is, when does an economic system in a society function well? So first of all, a precondition is we have to take into account all relevant scarcities. So, and one of the most fundamental scarcities is about land, about food. And if we ignore fundamental scarcities in a society, and just because we don't like this, so such an economic system is doomed to fail. And I'm coming from Germany. I grew up very much at the, at the eastern border. So we observed an economic system which basically ignored fundamental scarcities on physical capital. Now we are at the risk that we are ignoring fundamental scarcities like the limiting disposal space of the atmosphere, the life support of the biosphere, and also the scarcity of land, the scarcity of food, yeah, we do not take into account all the relevant scarcity. So this is a fundamental thing. The fact that economists and economics tries to translate these scarcities in a, in a kind of a dollar number is something which is nice, but not, not essential. And let me, let me basically highlight what kind of scarcity we are ignoring when we are talking about the food system. So we are ignoring health costs. But we do not take into account that some of our food makes people uh, 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 sick, that there is some obesity in the society, so we are eroding uh, uh, our own health. And forgive me that, so it's a, a little bit uh, a strange uh, notion in economics. We, we undermine fundamental human factors. So this is scarcity number one. The hidden costs, the health costs. We just do not take into account when we make our decisions in our society. The second one are the environmental costs. We ignore fundamental environmental scarcities and we ignore, for example, structural poverty in our society. This is also something about inequality. Inequality is, is, is quite important. And if we take into account all these aspects, it turns out that the costs of transforming the food system are less than uh, continuing with the business as usual scenario. So let me let me highlight a little bit. So what can we hope when we transform the uh, the, the food system? And it is not just about to say we earn much more money. So what we do is we we we, we stop undernutrition of people. 
So we could, with another food system, increase the productivity of workers in the food system. So one aspect seems to me is also quite important. We could stop the biodiversity loss. We depend very much on the biosphere and the biodiversity. And undermining biodiversity in the end, some kind of biodiversity is an intrinsic value. And economists are very interested in intrinsic values. And some of the biodiversity loss has immediate impact on, 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 on our production system. What we can also hope for when we transform the food system is, and this has a strong link to, to the climate system, so um, we could create, the food system could become a net carbon sink. At the very beginning, I said we ignore the limiting disposal space of the atmosphere. That's right. But we ignore also that the food system, the biosphere, could offer us natural sinks. And we have to find a way to compensate people when they provide carbon sinks. So, and, and I think there are many other aspects which, which, which are good and where we can say the, the costs of, of action are lower than the costs of inaction. However, and I think this is something which we basically follow the lines of Morton Bates economics. Within the report, we have another dimension. And this dimension is we are aware moving from one equilibrium to another equilibrium has its own transformational costs. So, and the question is, and, and even you could ask Nick Stern, the Stern report told us uh, in 2006 that the costs of non-action are higher than the costs of action. But the question is why the global society did not succeed to do this. Why is there so little... Uh, structural change towards uh, a transformation pathway towards the new equilibrium. And here we basically argued in, in, in the report that the short-term costs are very often concentrated on a few people and the benefits are dispersed. Benefit are basically for the future generations and, and this is an issue. And therefore we, we have, we said basically we have to, to take into account the risk of increasing food prices we have to take into account social issues, inequality issues, and we have to design purchases, uh, also the, the fear of job losses, and we have to design uh, a, a compensation packages which allows uh, people to, to move, not in the far distant future, but now. So roughly speaking, this is what we have done in the report, and I think it was reasonable economics, and I hope uh, I convinced you that economics is not just about dollar and euros. Economics is fundamentally about good decision making, and it is to a certain extent applied moral philosophy. Thank you so much, Otmar. And I think you really got to that second question I asked, which is why is this relevant? Up? And I think the relevance here is that this is a tool to help us contend with our limitation in in many parts of our societies to contend with the the real consequence of change in the long term. And whether that's because of discount rates we use or the disequilibrium in the benefits and the costs within society in the near term, it's something we haven't done very well. And we need all the tools we can get, like true cost accounting, to do it better. David, let's come to you. And we're joined by David Levant. Um, he's a Food Systems Economics Commission researcher. He's also the director of the Agri-Food Economics Division at the United Nations FAO. And his role supervises a number of flagship reports and is probably still catching his breath after the one you just launched, which is this year's uh, SOFA State of Food and Agriculture Report. And so um, let's, let's go to the report that you just launched with um, your team in November, David. You know, it, it told us that we're talking about at least $10 trillion in externalized costs beyond what is actually paid for food. We know that doesn't contend with the, all the intrinsic dimensions. So this is an undercount, uh, if anything. And and I think we can succinctly say that what it shows us is our current agri-food systems are borrowing value from future generations, if not robbing value from future generations. So can you explain to a world leader, David, you know, what, what is the so what for them at this COP? What are the key lessons from the SOFA report? And why is it important to discuss these findings here at COP28? 
Well, thank you, and thank you for this opportunity. And uh, actually, the, the work uh, done in the SOFA report released this year is built on, on many years of research, uh, including some done with the Food System Economic Commission, about putting a number and a credible number of incident costs. Clearly, it's not exhaustive, but as you said, for us, we know there are uncertainties, but we can say we are 19 95 percent sure that is at least 10 trillions per year and that's important because if you say to policymakers we have uncertainties we don't really know in many cases that's an excuse for statu quo and not action so we are 100 percent sure that is not zero and we are 95 percent sure that is more than 10 trillions so basically at least 10 percent of the world gdp and when we think about low-income countries it's even more than 25 percent for their gdp with value causes. So that's already clearly a call for action and we have a certainty that we have to do something. Now, actually, we slightly disagree with you saying that we are not robbing the next generation. What this report are showing is that we are robbing this generation potentially without even realizing it. Health costs that we were discussing are not the worst costs for our kids. Of course, if we have nutrition, they will have problems. But basically, 75% of these hidden costs in this report are linked to health costs, linked to unhealthy diets. Maybe we will pay the price in 20 years when after eating too much, we will all have diabetes, but we are the generation that should already take this into account. And on top of that, we have environmental costs. So some are also immediate. We have direct pollution. If you think about... Uh, NO2 pollution that's, that's immediate. And of course, we also uh, have the more uh, long-term impact for climate change, but also for the loss of, of biodiversity. And I think that's where it's important. And potentially, I will say for policymakers that say, you know, climate change is far, why we should really do something. The planet is not voting for us in two years. What the report is showing is actually, for instance, on the diet front, you have to act now for you and for your constituencies, and potentially your public finance and your incoming growth. And on top of that, you are going to help the planet. But you don't have to love the planet, really, to start to take these numbers and do something. So there is co-benefits in action. Of course, there are some trade-offs. We are not always going to address all the things, but there is a number of actions like having healthier diets that can deliver on our health, on planet's health, and if we eat a bit less, but we, pray, we pay a slightly higher price, we can include and increase the livelihood of people in the food system in reduced social cost, because we have too many poor people and extremely poor people that are at the core of the agri-food system. So that, you know what I will tell them, you know? There is immediate gain. They may not be fully visible, but we can put a number on it. That's not the whole story. I totally agree with, with my colleagues, okay? Uh, as economists, I care about incentive, I care about efficiency, I care about allocation of scarce resources, but sometimes you need to put a number on an ID. And if you don't put a number, people doesn't listen to you. This should not be the end of the story, but for us, it's the beginning of the story. We engage people, and this number is big enough to be uh, engaging, I think. So. Exactly. Well, looking at the size of the audience and, and those online, I think indeed it is engaging. It's an eye-catching number. And as you said, it's about making the immediate case for action and no longer enabling the delay on this critical agenda. So thank you, David. Um, I'd now like to shift to Annalise um, and, and really talk about the role of financing food systems transformation coming from philanthropy and the IKEA Foundation, where Annalise, um, you'd been the program manager there since 2014. So you, you really come to understand IKEA quite well. And you were working on the reshaping humanitarian response portfolio in the beginning, but now uh, lead the agricultural livelihoods portfolio strategy. <laughs> Where we are close, close colleagues. Um, so you've been a major funder of true cost accounting initiatives, including work on the Food Systems Economics Commission, through Cost Accounting Accelerator, Global Alliance for the Future of Food. Annalise, what is the role that financing plays in the transformation of the food system? And why has IKEA invested so heavily in this area? What are the implications 
for IKEA and philanthropy from this work, from what we're learning from these, you know, the at least $10 trillion in externalized costs from the food system? So first of all, thank you for having me here. And I'm, I'm really humbled to be sitting in this panel of so many smart people uh, that are here next to me and that will come after me. So it's a, it's a humbling experience to be here. That's also, I think, the, uh, the advantage of working for uh, IKEA Foundation. So the IKEA Foundation is the philanthropic arm of, of IKEA uh, company, but it's a different, it's a separate uh, entity. And we're committing really to spend our philanthropic funding to helping the many people across the world to build better livelihoods and at the same time to protect our planet, uh, to help people cope with climate change, but also fight climate change. And agriculture is for us a key area because, well, we all need food, we all need fiber, and so many people are working in agriculture across the globe and are dependent on it. At the same time, agriculture, as you all know, is uh, one of the big uh, contributors to climate change and also one of the big solutions to climate change. Uh, not only to climate change, but also the combination, the interconnection of climate change, biodiversity loss, and our social crisis that we're in, the growing inequality, growing poverty. So we invest substantially in it. We invest, we're very happy that we were uh, able to contribute to, to FSEC, to the Eat Lancet, to UNEP-T agri-food framework, uh, all these things, so TCA Accelerator. It's, it's really super engaging to, to be able to support that kind of research. It's important to, to make that economic case because policymakers need that kind of ammunition to convince their constituency that it's the right thing to do, the right thing to, to change their regulations, to, to change their uh, subsidies, uh, if they uh, take that economic case into account. Um, similarly, for the private sector, I think there's a big role for the private sector to, uh, to play as well. And we're supporting the, um, the evidence building from, for, for policy change, but also for corporate accountability and corporate uh, behavioral change. I think there's a key role to play there. So, yeah, you're asking me what the role of finance is. Um, we think that philanthropy has a role to play. Philanthropy, of course, is, is nothing. It's dwarfed by the big numbers that you are talking about here, the big numbers that that public sector has, the big numbers that the private sector also uh, can put in. Um, but philanthropy has a catalytic role to play. And we think that by, by looking carefully at what we can do with our little philanthropic capital, we should put all that capital together, together with the Rockefeller Foundation, also with the 20 plus or in, in 25 plus, I can't remember how many, uh, that are now part of the Global Alliance for the Future of Food, all philanthropies that are concerned with our future of food, with food systems across the globe. And um, putting all that capital together can and, and investing it in catalytic action can really make a difference, I think. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, what we wanted to, to say here. Wonderful. Wonderful. And I, I love the point that if we're really to scale schools like True Cost Accounting, the ability for philanthropy to play a catalytic role, making this school more mainstream and bringing the application into the policy space too. So thank you, Annalise and Otmar, David. You brought so many perspectives to this first round. And we're actually going to do a quick cost change. We have a second slate of incredible speakers. And so um, I'd now like to invite Jacqueline to take the stage. Uh, do we have Vera Songwe with us? Oh, yep. Okay. And, and Johan. And then we'll be joined by Pavan, who's on the stage. We see you quite centrally. <laughs> Pavan, it's wonderful to have you here. Greetings. Oh, thank you. Greetings. Great to be here. Oh, it is always a wonderful blessing when technology works. So this is great too. You know, let's start with you, Pavan, since we have you here. And I think I'll, I'll look at you there. You're visualized here. Um, Pavan is a scientist by education, an international banker by training, and an environmental economist by passion. So he's really a, a trifecta of in intriguing descriptors. He's previously led the United Nations Green Economy Initiative and the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity Initiative, TEAB, which I think all of us in this space have been so inspired and really rooted in. So, um, Pavan, you're a real um, a front runner here in this work. And he's now CEO of GIST. So, with that as an introduction, 
we're going to use this second portion of the panel to get very specific on examples. What are we learning on the ground when this is applied in real places? What does it tell us? And and how are we seeing the elucidation of the true cost equal some kind of policy change? So, Pavan, take us to India, if you would, and the example of the application of TCA in Andhra Pradesh with the community-managed natural farming. What lessons should global leaders take from the application of TCA in the Indian context? I saw the opportunity and to beam in, as it were. Um, the case that I'm describing is perhaps the largest instance of natural farming around the world. Um, at the time when we did the study, which you referred to, uh, it was it involved 630,000 farmers who were somewhere along the curve, if not fully converted. And that number has apparently grown already now, something like a quarter million farmers. But of course, it's a large state in India, in the eastern side. Uh, it has a population of over 55 million, and of which 6 million farmers. So this is still um, starting steps, if you like, in that direction. Uh, what did we learn from this? Well, I think the first thing to bear in mind is the complexity of food systems. It comes straight through. Um, for too long, and, and, and this, the use of per hectare productivity as a single metric we wish to measure food system performance has been used and I would say misused. And uh, using the United Nations True Cost Accounting Initiative called Teabagri Food, that, uh, that's just a, a title. But it's basically a United Nations food cost accounting approach, which covers things holistically. So the first learning was that, look, it is not only necessary, but it is possible to look at food systems, not just from a uh, single dimension lens, but from a multidimensional lens in economic terms. In other words, it is possible to measure um, more complex aspects. Yield, of course, you must. Profits at farm, of course, you must. But equally, you should look at nutrition for those who consume health impacts for the on-farm, uh, very important. You should look at community dimensions and co cooperation and collaboration and knowledge sharing. You should look at the, uh, going to the environmental side, greenhouse gas impacts of one or the other or the other kind of farming. You should look at water use impacts. You should look at diversity impacts, perhaps most importantly, soil, soil impacts and soil richness. And uh, last and not the least, although it's quite difficult to measure this as yet, but one does get anecdotal evidence of resilience. In other words, how strongly, given the impacts of climate change and how strongly can one or the other food system survive? So I think the first learning was that it is not only necessary, but it is possible to look at food system from what I call a wide angle lens, a lens with many different angles of view. The second that we learned was when we actually engaged the study, and in this case, it was a study of a, um, a sample of 550 households taken across three uh, uh, agroecological regions because there is the low land delta farming fish, which is high input, high fertilizer input. Then there's the, the southwestern region, which is what we call it dry land farming, uh, heavily dependent on, on irrigation and I would call it the third reason being the default organic of poor tribal communities in the Northeast. So uh, we learned that you can't make generic statements. We really have to go down and look at kinds of dominant systems and then evaluate the alternatives. So in fact, we didn't have one counterfactual. We had three different counterfactuals in three different broad regions. And then we evaluated this onset of natural farming which it could be called regenerative farming as it's widely understood around the world, although it has its own regional variations across the entire state. And we found that on average, and that is our learning number two, yields actually went up. And this was startling for most people because the general presumption is that somehow when you do natural farming, yields go down. And we were finding the exact opposite. On average, yields went up by 11%. But there were certain areas and certain crops, and such as cash crops like chilies, for instance, the yields went up 50, 70%. Uh, other yields like rice would go up 85% and so on. And um, across the board, the other important thing is because of a combination of factors which varied from location to location. In the Delta regions, which is high input, it was because of the lower cost of fertilizers. 
in the uh, tribal regions, it was because of high due to advanced snakes using uh, nutrients, which are bio-nutrients, bio remediation of soil, basically, using those locally available nutrient bioremediation technique, yields went up. And in the Southeast, it was a combination of costs and yields. Uh, Southwest, it was a combination. So for different reasons, we found that actually farm treatments went up almost 50%. In fact, on average, 49% across these 560 households. That, my friends, is huge because more income in the hands of the poor farmer, which means it's a solution to poverty. It's a social solution. It's a development solution. And it in leads to all of the benefits of getting more income in poor families. And perhaps, and then this I come to my, my point, what were the drivers? We learned that one of the most important drivers was the social capital, not just the better use of natural capital, not just the better uh, application of human capital knowledge, but actually the social capital of the communities that were involved. Because in fact, the success of the natural farming was largely driven by the fact that there existed a microfinance network, self-help groups, and women. Women collaborating with women, information sharing, knowledge sharing, microfinance, and working with their families on farms to produce the results that we, that we have measured and described. So not only was there a strong base of social capital, but it actually improved as a result of applying that to natural farming methods. Um, there are numerous beautiful images, you'll get them on the web, of women, farmers, proudly showing how their crops, their rice crops are more resilient than that of their neighbors, which are chemical crops. Women proudly describing their success. They come from poor backgrounds, sometimes scheduled caste backgrounds, sometimes un, you know, lacking in any finance, taking microfinance loans to engage this new kind of farming. And I think that aspect is perhaps to me the one that carries, uh, stays the longest and deepest with me, which is that here's a way of providing uh, social recognition of women and actually a potential change in village societies in India. My friends, this is already scale. 600, 750,000 farmers is already scale. The question is, can it replicate? And today, the good news is that it's beginning to replicate. We are seeing it being applied in states such as Himachal in the north of India and, and uh, uh, um, other states like uh, Madhya Pradesh and and Karnataka in the center of India and so on. And I hope that this can, this, these approaches can be replicated in other parts of the world where experiments have been done. Uh, so all in all, there were these four important things in the which came from undertaking this study. And I must thank the, those who conducted the study because this was primary research conducted largely during the years of COVID. Our colleagues who conducted the research colleagues who pull together the data and analyze it, which is available to all of you. It's all available on uh, Python code and data, which are put together by the study leader and uh, numerous collaborators, too many to name, to be honest. But, uh, they're all there on the web. They were launched in, uh, the study was launched at the FAO in Rome in July earlier this year. And I thank the FAO for hosting uh, that launch and for the information system for adopting the what is known earlier as the TV approach, but essentially it's the wide angle lens, the, the uh, uh, approach saying that, look, you need to look across the value chain, you need to look at all capitals. Just... Thank you. Thank you so much, Pavan. And it is so extraordinary, I think, for institutions um, like my own and, and uh, just thinking of a particular network of which we're a part, just 24 philanthropies asking the question what it would take to accelerate financing to this transformation, natural, community managed natural farming, indigenous foodways, agroecology, and regenerative. And, you know, one of the the points of pushback is that, you know, you're, you're trying to do too many things. Let's, let's simplify it. Let's talk about carbon. When you apply, as you did, a true cost accounting lens, you see to, to make such a narrow application of a shift in production is to leave value on the table. You quantified the value across the social, the health, and some unexpected revelations came out of that study, but the numbers are undeniable, the profit for the farmers, the social cohesion. So just thank you for the inspiration you've you've given us, Pavan, through your work. Um, I'd like to go to Jacqueline. Hello. 
Uh, Jacqueline McGlade is chief scientist and co-founder of Downforce Technologies. She's professor at Strathmore University Business School, and she was formerly chief scientist at the United Nations Environment Program. And you led a true cost accounting analysis in Kenya. Yes, the, um, the Mount uh, Mao Forest Complex in Kenya, yes, as part of the Teeb agri-food family, uh, which is so wonderful. So can you take us to the results of the application of this analysis in Kenya? What did you learn? What were the findings? Were they uh, aligned with what Pavan just described in India? And then maybe I'll, I can leave the second question, but how can a local case like this translate to an argument to apply true cost accounting at global level? How does it build the case? Fantastic. Well, I, I do want to thank Pavan because he's been always a pathfinder in this field. Um, I know sometimes we thought you were a hard taskmaster. You know, the tools matter. You have to apply them properly. Don't mess about, collect the data, analyze it properly, etc. So, you know, we listened well. But I think even you would have been surprised, Pavan, when you saw some of the people in the tea project in Kenya, who many of whom had never been to school, literally had no education, and who had a facility in their own way to do true cost accounting. And I think that was the biggest outcome, was that, it, in effect, it just made good sense. So whether it was the social capital or the natural capital, we began with the natural capital because it was a, a large, very important ecosystem which gives water to 30 million people. And effectively, you must have read about it in the newspapers, people are being displaced out of the forest because of the degradation, quarter of a million hectares eroded, etc. Soils running down, rivers not running with any water and so on. So it was a, it was a desperately bad story. But when we started, we, from the get-go, thought we would make it as a community-led process. So we started literally at the bottom. The difference being that many of these people are not farmers, in fact. They're just sort of living in the forest, and they've sort of got jobs in not very good conditions, riding motorbikes, doing various other things. At the end of the program, we had one metric, which I think really brings it home, which is at the beginning, you could genuinely say, two or three livelihoods per hectare. At the end, in the places where we worked with 100,000 households, so each household has about 10 people in it, eight to 10 people, there were 12 livelihoods associated with every hectare. Now, when I say livelihoods, it could be farming, yes, but it could also be medicinal plants, it could be the dairy cow. It could be many other things. And I think genuinely, this is where social capital made its mark because you have a certain number of natural assets. You have ecosystem services. You want to improve them. But at the end of the day, you're never going to improve them unless people feel secure that there's going to be some livelihood, some capital, some prosperity that's going to come out of this. And Kenya, like many African countries, suffers from the problem of dividing up the land. So, you know, parents, fathers will have the land, they'll divide it, they'll divide it, and then you're looking at one hectare and four brothers, you know, and there's not, there's not a happy place to be. Oh, and lots of cows as well. So it's, it's just a very crowded place. But by taking a natural capital and a social capital process and looking at the networks whereby people considered themselves to be prosperous. So we asked the fundamental question, what does prosperity mean to you? And we got a wide array of answers, and it was rarely about money. It was usually clean environment, access to education, power of voice. People really felt very strongly they weren't being heard, and, and many other elements around that. So when we started to look at, well, how can we strengthen that social capital? What are the networks that you use? We found on average they had 10, maybe 12 networks, a faith network to do something, a women's network to do something else. In the Maasai, where, I, where I'm a member of the tribe, it's about the age warriors, the classes like that. Okay, So people were going to these different networks. And when we realized that the social networks were going to deliver livelihoods out of this one hectare, then it began to make sense. But where the true, uh, I think where the true cost accounting came to its own was where we actually tied all the pieces together. And I'll just give you one glimpse of what that looks like. So we have a lot of flower growers in Kenya, and they are 
I won't say they're pilloried, but they don't have a very happy life sometimes because people say, well, you fly all those flowers to Europe with a very big footprint. So we've been working with them to see how we could adjust that. And what has come out of it is quite extraordinary. So there are many people who go and cut flowers every morning, but every one of them has a farm or a piece of land which they're using. So in the afternoons, when the flowers are cut, they go back to their farm. By creating an understanding about regenerative farming, improving soil health, already their yields were increasing. But then we started to think about what else would they be able to do? And the rose growers and the flower growers need biomass and they need biochar and they need ways to increase the amount of carbon going in. So now the waste from the, the little farms is put together, centralized, and they get paid for that. And then they can make out of the little nuts that they collect around the trees that they've planted around the edges, they can make a beautiful oil for pharmaceutical purposes. Okay, but the shells are actually an energy source. So now they have a crushed shell process to make that. So now even the edges of the farm are beginning to generate income. And then out of all of this, you have some waste, you have chicken heads and lots of other things. So what do you need to do? We need to cook it. So you take any food waste, you turn it into methane. The methane is used to cook the chicken heads. The chicken heads are then ground up with any other waste. That becomes the food for the black soldier flies. The black soldier flies are basically protein for the livestock. So essentially, the whole thing starts to work its way. And in the end, we have farmers now who genuinely are, and families who are using this one hectare plot to create a true value, I would say, a true value accounting, and planting trees and bringing water to the surface. So the end of the result was in the, in the forest, we managed to restore 500 kilometers of rivers by planting trees. We managed to raise the, the average livelihood of 100,000 households by $2,000. I mean, it was pretty much zero when we started. But it wasn't just simply grow a production crop. It wasn't just grow avocados or grow a grain. There was just layer upon layer upon layer of these different kind of value added products that they were generating. So for me, the answer for the true value accounting has been empower people to be able to do it for themselves so they can actually understand through their social networks how to create the value. Don't come in and tell people how to create value. And with that, we now have, I think, a pipeline of extremely high integrity carbon projects. And that's the that's the sort of the big tick at the end, because they then realize that what they're doing is growing carbon as well as growing food. And people are willing to invest in that. So, yeah, that was the tea experience for us. It, it's just extraordinary how it's come into its own as a circular a demonstration of circular economy, viable carbon credits, which is a miracle in its own right. Um, and, and the application of TCA sounds like it was the necessary um, it was the data. It was the data. The data to the make make the case. Has this um, penetrated? Given the success that you've observed through this, has it penetrated the policy circle in any way? Yeah. So I, d I didn't think very much about downforce because it's, it's, a, it's a startup that I created when I left the UN to try and speed the process up. But what we were able to do was to translate that rather ragged picture into coherent metrics. And that's what got the attention of policymakers. So now in Kenya, for those of you who don't know, is we have an extremely, I think, um, forward thinking policy around carbon. Not only the fact that there's going to be, of course, direct air capture, we can talk about that another time. But in terms of biogenic and agricultural production, we now have a policy that says, 45% as a minimum of carbon revenues have to go to the community. Now, that is a whole different way of thinking about the, the travesty of what's gone on in the past. But what it has created then is the beginnings of a good infrastructure, a policy infrastructure that values food and agriculture as one of the engines for the carbon process, for the carbon sequestration process. And actually, a year or two ago, it wasn't seen like that at all. So I think data has transformed the policy conversation and financial grade data has meant that we now have a Nairobi Securities Exchange where you will actually see carbon projects now appearing. So I think that's what you need in many senses is that financial uh, impetus and then the data to back it up. 
quite see that we have another co-chair of the Food Systems Economics Commission with us, Johan Swinnen. Could we get you up here for a moment? Um, we're just so glad to have you have you with us in the house today. And I think building on the example application that um, maybe we could share the microphone with him, um, that, that we just heard from Jacqueline, um, Johan, it'd be wonderful to get your sense of how this construct of true cost accounting is becoming more and more a feature of the political economy environment. And, and what do you think really are the political economy constraints that will need to be overcome to not just mainstream TCA, but take on the magnitude of different types of action needed to wrestle down these externalities that it reveals? Thanks very much, uh, and uh, thank you for inviting me. And it's great to see people. I had worked at Altman for uh, many years on the Food Systems Economics Commission. I saw him many times on the screen, and this is the first time we meet live. So it's, uh, it's a great pleasure from that way as well. I'll start with the bad news first, okay? and then I'll move to some more optimistic views. So I think um, speaker or several speakers have pointed at what they call the disequilibrium of the benefits and costs, right? So that the costs are concentrated, are in the short run, and the benefits are dispersed and in the long run. And that, of course, when you think about this in, in terms of how it affects political action, I mean, obviously, the incentives are, are different there. So the opposition in the short run is stronger and, and the support is less uh, uh, strong. Okay. Um, I think it's a very important effect, the, these things, but I think it's a bit, um, there are several additional factors. And I want to go back to a moment not so long ago where we actually made a major food system transformation. And this was in the 1970s and 1980s. It was a massive distortion of agricultural markets in the world where uh, in developing countries, uh, governments were taxing their many farmers very heavily, while in the rich countries, uh, governments were subsidizing farmers very heavily. And so what we've seen in the 1990s and, and the 2000s, that there's been major reforms in this, okay? And so a lot of the taxation in, development, uh, in developing countries gone, a lot of the subsidies in rich countries are still there, but in a way which is much less distortive in global markets, okay? And so we could learn from this, and I think it's a very important lesson that we know these things happened. It was at the global level, and so it happened across the world. And this should give us um, hope that we can uh, re, uh, repeat this thing here. Now, what is different? Well, I think one thing which is different, which uh, several speakers pointed out, I think the situation was, the issue was more complex. Because at that point, the focus was really on distortions in markets about prices really, or subsidies or, or taxes. Well, now we are dealing with health issues, environmental issues, resilience issues, uh, biodiversity issues, et cetera. So the, the package of things we have to deal with are, is much more complicated. And this uh, makes also, I mean, people always talk about the straight offs. There's also win-wins that are there, but just identifying them. If you see, I mean, at, in IFPRI, we are working together with the World Bank. And, and, and FAO to work on these, the repurposing, which is really subsidy reform again, okay? But just the, the calculations that are needed, the modeling efforts to actually identify these things and the interaction are really complicated. And so that means you have to translate that to people's, inc uh, to people's situation, et cetera. It is complicated. The second one is that the, uh, if it's, there's a lot of uncertainty, it's not as clear. That means also that people have less incentive to support it because they're uncertain about the benefits. And they may think we are may, may also be among the losers, so they're more strong to oppose us. So that kind of reinforces it. Of course, it also means there's more agents involved. I mean, different types of organizations, companies, et cetera, to, to get in, in the discussions. Another point which I would like to make is that in a lot of, and this is something which economists are not usually dealing with, there is something which, uh, where Kuhn de Koning from OECD has done a beautiful report on what he called interests and values. And so when we talk about winners and losers, as economists, we think about interest, okay? So I'm losing you benefits, so you can compensate me, and then we move forward. However, if people feel this is not just about money, it is about the way of life, that's values, okay? That's what he calls values, okay? And that means, I mean, a, a very good example is the GMO debate, okay, where people really do not perceive this just as a money thing. It's really about the concept of how they perceive society. I think 
in the food system transformation, we're seeing this as well. If you see the opposition, for example, of farmers in Western Europe against some of the, the restrictions on, on, on emissions, I mean, it's, it, it threatens their livelihood. So it's way beyond just, just dollars, I think. And then I think in the way we are getting information these days is a lot of it is, I mean, basically, by far the most information coming to people is through social media, social and mass media. And that kind of is inherent in social media is that you have this, what I call an echo chamber effect. So it reinforces this. If you're opposing, you talk to people who also oppose. You have this, act, and that reinforces polarization, again, contributing or making it harder to find a, a compromise. So let me least make a few good uh, <laughs> positive points, right? I think one is that we have to do look is for non-traditional coalitions. I think if you see in general when you have reforms happening, um, if we often talk about producers, consumers, and here the environment as well, right? But in reality, you know, if you in developing in rich countries, like uh, from all the consumer spending, which is really the value chain, if you want, only five or ten percent is income for farmers. All these ninety percent is all kinds of other businesses and companies and organizations which are in there. Now, the most recent estimates show that even in lower and middle income countries, that number is 30%. That means also there, these other agents and actors and um, various organizations, could be NGOs, could be large multinational companies, have, to have the bulk of the income and the, and the engagement. So that means you have to think about bringing these, these people on board, engaging them, and See, for example, I've been involved in a couple of very interesting discussions on the diet transformation and, and also the meat transformation, moving to vegetarian or, or vegan systems. And what you see is that large companies are on both sides of these arguments. So this is not just about poor farmers with big companies. No, I mean, it's a much more complex uh, puzzle. And then, of course, if you bring in civil society, etc., it adds to it. And I think, and then, of course, there's a big global south versus global north issue. All these things we have to think very creatively, I think, of, of bringing them on board. And I think the last two points are uh, maybe very briefly because I think I've used up my time here. One is on bundle, the bundling, which is you have to put together a package of policies, okay? Because that helps essentially in addressing some of these um, distributional effects. The other one is just improving the information, right? Even despite all the fact I've said about social media. And, and so organizations like what we do, we provide, try to come up with evidence, okay? And I think that's really important. I think what we're doing here right now, that's really very important. It is enhancing information, turning it into very visual things. And with that, I think investing in education, I think there's a huge generational effect in this, uh, in this issue. So let me leave it at that. Thank you so much. And it's just really been a, a fabulous, fabulous panel. And I think it's it's a pity we're at the close and, and yet we are. And so I'm going to invite all of the panelists to go um, give a very short 30 second to uh, a rapid uh, round of final reflections. And here's your question. Given all that you know, all that you've seen in terms of what true cost accounting as a tool can offer, what is your number one call to action for policymakers here at COP? So why don't we start with you, Joe? We'll go this way and we'll end with David. And we'll have to speak into the microphone for the benefit of our friends on Zoom. Um, I wasn't really prepared for that question, but <laughs> I think we sit around the table and, and basically I realize the urgency and there's no, I mean, it's really a, a very simple point, but there's really no time to lose right now. Okay? And I think that's the crucial thing. And I think the, the I mean, some of the developed countries really have to give the example on things this, just for domestic reasons, not even for the international reasons as well. Yep. Speed and commitment. Pavan. Um, simple single point. Transform cities. I'll give you a small example. The government of India, sadly, it's just a three-year package of $45 billion, of which 99.6% of that farm package is basically urea subsidies. That can't happen again. You have to help the farmers, these millions and millions of people, by giving them the funds to decide where they spend the money, as against giving the subsidies to fertilizer uh, companies to manufacture chemical outputs at a lower price. Thank you. Um, I think mine would have to be 
let's try and create an international understanding that we have to provide farmers with the insurance to underpin what is going to be, for many of them, a very risky step. The transformation may actually expose them to risks and, and lack of knowledge about things, and they'll need that support. So I think a strong insurance, affordable insurance, could be one of the keys that will incentivize people to change. Brilliant. Annalise. Um, yeah, my point would be, I think, going back to the point uh, Otmar made at the beginning, this transformational cost that is needed to move from one to the other equilibrium uh, is there. Uh, but recognize the allies that, in, that are in the room, uh, pull us in as philanthropy, pull private sector in, change your subsidies and, and change your incentives for private sector to, to actually be part of this. And be careful because you will be held accountable, governments. Yes. Otmar. Yeah, so I, I I think I have nothing specific to add to two, two points I would like to make. But the first one is uh, what Joe said is, is, is very important. So behind this this dollar and euro numbers, so this is this is only one part of the problem, right? So it's it's in the end a fundamental value issue. Even if we translate it into dollars, it's a value issue. And this is something which I would like to emphasize, even if we say there's an externality. This is a value issue because in the end, we value something which is otherwise ignored by markets or even by, by, by governments. So that's that's important. This does not deny this is a huge number and huge numbers are important because otherwise governments would never act, would never would never do something. So there's a strong agreement. But then it, it comes to the to the um, to the complicated part from my point of view. In the end, um, when you have such a huge number and you need such a fundamental transformation process, you need government action. And this basically, you need taxes, you need basically uh, a public money, you need, you need a, a, a lot of in investment in that. And this makes the whole thing incredibly important. And I fully agree what has been said, uh, there are tremendous co-benefits, but we should always ask the question, despite of the co-benefits, why is change so hard? So this, we are here at the COP, and here at the COP, we, we really can feel it, how hard it is uh, to, to change, even if we know that. And from my point of view, there, there are a few things which we should take into account. So first of all, um, the, the value issue, the identity issue. So it's not just, you, and you can, you, you can trade costs and benefits, but it is very hard to trade identities, right? So in that sense, and, and we have, our answers are not good enough, uh, for what what is a motivational stable transformation pathway? I think we have to work on this, to 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 convince in spite of the uh, of all these uh, opportunities. And the last thing I would like to re-emphasize has been said many times: we need governments. Governments have to take action. They have to 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 provide the taxes, the incentives, internalizing all this external. This is a, a very important step forward. And here we should not uh, allow governments. To shy away and say, ah, let's let's the consumers do the job. Let's 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 basically try to to change the diet. This is this is not the right thing to do. And governments are this is this is only probably it's only half of the uh, of of the component, but it's an incredibly important uh, 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 component. And we should basically uh, rely. We should not rely on government as such. But we should uh, take them responsible for this. That this is basically the job here. Wonderful, really holding governments to account. And I'm going to give the final word to Vera Songway. Uh, we're so glad to have you with us. Uh, the second to the final word. Hold that thought. Let's go to David. David Lord, uh, give, give us your 30 seconds before we come to Vera. And we're just so happy to have you. I was getting ahead of myself there. Um, what's the key message, the so what for those at COP? So that they will not address everything at COP because when we talk about agri-food system, we are talking about food security, we are talking about climate, we are going about biodiversity. So if we maintain the silos approach, we are not going to make it. Now, we can do something here is to mobilize climate finance because potentially the reality that we have much more money to deal with climate than to deal with food insecurity or such other issue today, especially if you have to transfer money from the global north to the global south, because that's going to be key. 
And here, what we can do is to make better rules to make sure that climate finance can go to agriculture and agri-food system, because today it's very difficult. Silos smashing for finance liberation. Um, we are so happy to have you. And I, I open by saying there, there's no late at COP. We manifest when we manifest. <laughs> and the great distances that we are running uh, to, to get ourselves from one place to the other. So you really do get the final word. We've covered it all. We started at the big why, so what? What is true cost accounting? What can we expect from the Food Systems Economics Commission? What did we learn in Andhra Pradesh, in Kenya, from funders? We've kind of taken the whole 360, but given all that you've seen from your uh, your posts there as one of the co-chairs of this effort and all that you're hearing from COP, what are your hopes for this kind of next chapter for the application and the mainstreaming of true cost accounting? And how do you hope that changes what happens for the remaining six days here at COP? No, thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, late, so thanks for staying on. Uh, uh, good to see you, Otmar. Uh, I think we've spent two years seeing each other on uh, videos and we haven't met. And Ravi, of course, who is the our third uh, uh, musketeer in the FSEC uh, uh, conversation. So as I'm really, really happy that we can have uh, this conversation on food systems here today. I'm late because I was just coming from a room where there were over 50 finance ministers from the world that want to talk about climate. So, uh, uh, and in some sense, uh, the last speaker who said you're transferring money from the global north to the global south, I was actually saying today, the MDBs, it's a net zero, if not net negative, transfer of money from the global south to the global north. And we, and we cannot talk about climate finance if that's how the financing is stacking up today, where we are getting transfers in the opposite direction. So it was quite an important conversation there to make that point. I think in some sense in the FSEC report, you know, innovate uh, incentives and instruments. I think the, 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 the important conversation really is, yes, it's policy. Uh, yes, it's not going to affect everybody the same way. And we have to understand, you know, where are the incentives to push. But another number is $7 trillion of subsidies are being put into you know fossil fuels agriculture and different sectors of the world if we were to pour all that back our report that you know we launched earlier today is asking for 2.4 trillion annually we're giving 7.7 .7 trillion dollars annually of subsidies some of them are good but 7 trillion is almost three times what we're asking for to begin to address the climate challenge so the resources are there the question is now, how can we direct them to the right places? Can we ensure, you know, and, it, and, it, and wrapping up, you know, one of the really great things is that we heard Kristalina and a few others, IJ Bangar and the UAE, there is a commitment now for methane reduction, right? And there is going to be some resources going into methane reduction. Yesterday, we heard again the minister of the UAE and uh, CGIAR announcing $200 million for food-resistant crops and seeds and all that. So I think there are different parts of the system that are beginning to come together. And we're hoping, of course, there's loss and damage that is also there and important. But we're hoping that as we do all of this, we can actually impact the food systems in a way, and this is important because I just said on the other side, 980 million people depend on agriculture and, and the land for their subsistence. That is 27% of the employment workforce of the world. So as we talk about food systems and as we talk about reducing you know, the stress on the land, we have to make sure that we do it in an equitable, just way so that we do not make these people lose their incomes. And I think that's where the innovation begins to happen. You know, what can we do? How can we make those transitions? Which are also skills transitions so that people can move into different skills and provide different services as we do this food systems transition. And I think those conversations, the UAE with the Altera Fund, $30 billion, was just announced. The World Bank has been able to stretch its balance sheet at another $60 billion. The private sector, hopefully, is going to come together and deliver something. Uh, uh, but I think that there is some positive momentum. What we really need is to see the money and then use it at scale and, and with speed so that it doesn't become more expensive to get to where we want to get to by 2030 and especially by 2050. Thank you.
Brilliant. And and true cost accounting is a method to show us where those dollars are in the system to recruit and redeploy exactly against what you're saying. Thank you so much to every one of these brilliant speakers. It's a real honor to, to hold this space with all of you. We're all very excited about January to see what comes from the Food Systems Economics Commission first dispatch. And thank you to all of you for putting your time into this agenda with all of us and to everyone online. Have a wonderful rest of your evening or day.